So by about now, one week to go to the election, if you're like me, you'll be totally sick of personality politics. With bland Julie and try to be a hunk Tony <laughs> out there campaigning about actually nothing. So that's what I'm not going to do tonight. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about nothing. What I want to do is talk about profound ideas and principles because that's what's missing from this campaign. So is the thing working? <laughs> Come on. Ah, right. So you know who I am. Uh, we've been out door knocking. We've door knocked about ten to 12,000 houses. There's a lot of people not here today because it's cold. There's flus going around. But generally people are disconnected from the political process because I think they're fed up, as I said, with the personality politics. Because the main issue of this campaign is left out of the equation. It's left out by default. We're getting a lot of negative, a lot of negative stuff coming through like de facto. And you've heard Dick Smith the last week or so, in fact this very night, about right now, there's the biggest piece of criminality happening on the television on this so-called population debate. So-called because it's a complete and utter fraud. I think Dick is in a knot. <laughs> he is having a lot of trouble trying to find out where he stands <laughs> because he has no idea what the hell he's talking about. Yeah. Look, 22 years ago, when I founded the CEC, and the reason we are here today, in this very room, the reason we have a youth movement, the reason we have thousands of members is simply for one reason. We started, that is I started with Noel, my wife and others, a movement based upon principle. And the central principle was that mankind is not an animal. That mankind is created with created reason, that we have a reason to be able to make discoveries of the physical principles that govern the universe. These are unseen by the senses, but we as human beings uniquely can make those discoveries, then apply them through science and technology into the manufacturing and uh, processes of our society to increase and change the lot of mankind. In a sense, we're made in the image of God, or imago vividae, as the term is known, made in the living image of the Creator. Therefore, there is no such thing as finiteness or finite resources. There is no such thing as carrying capacity. When you look at the universe, the universe is an incredibly complex system. And through the work of LaRouche in particular and the LaRouche movement internationally, we've been looking at this question of what does a universe really look, at, look like? And the great biochemist Vladimir Vernatsky, back in the late 19th and early 20th century, made a breakthrough. He defined the universe as being consisting of three primary phase change or phase spaces. The first he defined as the lithosphere, or the inert or non-living. The second was the living. The processes are governed by the principle of life, that physical principle. You can't see life, but you can see the effects of life. Either you're living or you're dead. You're either breathing or you're not. So the principle of life is what governs the living processes. But you have a higher order than this, which is the processes by which man can control both the biosphere and the lithosphere. And I'm going to go through quite a bit of this tonight and maybe one time down the track, Dick Smith can get an education by listening to what I have to say. The reality is, the reason we have 6.8 billion people on the face of the planet today is because mankind is not an animal. Because we have this ability, this innate creative reason to make these discoveries, we have been able to change the face of the planet to support more and more people to the tune of 6.8 billion people. 
That's the simple fact of the matter, and it's reflected in the population statistics itself. And any idea of cutting population or cutting the idea or even ignoring the idea that man is not some creation with, in de with, with creativity is a very, very dangerous, very dangerous approach. Recently, or last year, I was up in Mildura and I had to bring this tractor, this marvellous piece of machinery, all the way up from Melbourne to Mildura. It took three or four weeks to get there. But what animal would create that? I don't see a cow building that or a dog. So that's the nature of who we are, to define creativity. We look at, we discovered in this, if you look at the principles that are being embodied here, you see the principle of circular action. It's been embodied in the wheels. And you also see that this is an internal combustion engine, so therefore we've actually harnessed the principles of, of steam power, and then later diesel power. When you look around, when the fact that you're here today means you've ate something, you've eaten something. Well, that food that you're eating today has been developed. It's been developed purely by the, 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 the means of human creativity, of human experimentation, of changing what already exists in the biosphere for the better. And here you can see, for example, a corn cob, the original type of corn cob, which you can see is only the size of a, you know, an American 25 cent piece, quarter, right? As opposed to what we have today. This is because of the process of science and technology being placed into our community, which no other animal does. Human creativity means that resources are not limited. Take, for example, metals. On the right, you have this gravelly stuff. It's all over Western Australia. It's called bauxite. There is not one ounce or one gram of aluminium metal on the face of this planet that has not been manufactured by mankind. Aluminium is completely, the metal aluminium is, is, a, is, a, substance, is, is, a, is a metal that was being created by mankind, making the necessary discoveries to reduce aluminium oxide, which is that gravelly stuff, into the metal. So we have built aeroplanes, we've built skyscrapers, we've built, you, may, you name it, cans of coke with that metal because of the process of human creativity, of scientific and technological advancement. Take our health. We've made discoveries of things called penicillin and antibiotics that have transformed the way that we treat people medically. Now, people say, well, you know, one day aluminium's going to run out. Oh, is it? It'll run out at a certain level of technology, of energy flux density, but what is to stop us from getting aluminium from seawater? Because there's plenty of it in there, or from other sources. So it's not the case that we are limited or have limited resources. What happens is the technology that we need in order to be able to get those resources changes. And we require higher and higher levels of energy flux density, which I'll speak about more in a moment, in order to be able to extract, extract resources that do run down in this raw form. But this is the view of man that we as an organisation have been battling in this campaign, particularly Calvin Thompson, because in, a, in essence, the truth of the matter behind the back door, so to speak, is that he believes that human beings are no different than animals. That human beings have a carrying capacity. That we are to be compared to cows and dogs and other animals that we chew up finite resources. That's what Dick Smith believes. But see, this is not a new idea by any means. This is an oligarchical idea. This is treating men and women like animals, like beasts or like slaves. That's what this is. So how can you have, well, what's the model? Well, go back and look at what we've had in history. The fact that we had history as a matter, uh, slavery as a matter of history, as a matter of record, shows the subjugation of one human being by another. Goes back to ancient times. 
the idea that one human being can lord it over another because you have this oligarchical idea where you have an elite ruling over the mass few. Or look at drugs. Look at the legalization movements of drugs. Look at the amount of drugs that there are in the world today. Drugs destroy the human mind, which is deliberate. You could wipe out drugs tomorrow if there was the willfulness internationally to do so. But as we know, the Queen of England does push drugs, just like Mr. LaRouche has said very, very clearly, because this is part of an oligarchical system. An oligarchical system is the British Empire. The British Empire, basically, of free trade and globalisation, privatisation, and all those policies that are causing Australians to become slaved, enslaved to a monetary and financial system. That's not what's talked about by the likes of Mr. Calvin, uh, Calvin Thompson or Dick Smith. They don't talk about the fact that their policies derive from an oligarchical system, from slavery. That's what this, this, what, this is what globalisation is. Instead, they push this idea as sustainability or population stabilisation or use fancy words in order to try and create the means to stop population growth. And that's what we've seen in this campaign. These, ca these cartoons that we've been putting out and having a lot of fun with, mm -hmm. I want to eliminate you. These aren't put out glibly. These are a statement of methodological fact. Take the opposite, for example, of the concept of oligarchism or of globalisation or free trade and privatisation and economic rationalism. What's the opposite? The opposite is the idea of a sovereign nation state. Where a sovereign nation state exists for the benefits of the people in it so that those people are not treated like slaves. That they're treated like human beings with creative reason. Right? That those people are governed from the point of view of what we call the general welfare or the common good. That's a completely different idea of government, one that does not exist today, that doesn't even exist in the memories of at least two generations of people. So what we have today is the opposite. We have this guy promoting policies that are that of pure and simple the old British Empire, the old system of oligarchy. And of course they use fancy names like sustainability. Everyone's got to be sustainable. You know, you've got to have a sustainable population. You've got to have sustainable this and sustainable that. But the underlying premise of sustainability is the fact that there is limited resources. That's the, that's the thing that's not being told. This, that's the hidden key. That animal, human beings are nothing more than animals that are chewing up these limited resources. So you can see the irony of that cartoon where kids are sharpening their knives and going to blow their parents away because the parents aren't sustainable mm -hmm. in the eyes of the kids. And maybe, you know, some baby boomers shove their parents in nursing homes for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Alright? Or Julia Gillard coming out with the sustainable, po the popula sustainable population ministry. Mm -hmm. Go back to her pedigree, the same as Calvin Thompson. They're both Fabians, members of the Fabian Society. What was that? It was an institution specifically set up by the Sydney and Beatrice Webb at the turn of the last century, by H.G. Wells, by uh, the likes of um, Bertram Russell. What? To destroy the optimism that came out of the 1960s, 1970s, great revolution under Lincoln in the US of optimism because of the explosion of creativity that was allowed to happen because Lincoln uh, supported the concept of the American system, which was based, of course, on this idea of a sovereign nation state. So what do we got? We have the worst leaders in this country pushing policies to literally kill people. And they're all stark raving nuts. Which is why we've got that cartoon. Because they're simply, how can you not deny the actual reality of who we are as human beings. That we are creative. You only have to look 
around to see what humankind has been able to do and has been stopped from actually doing. Right? So this, it, those who, these, these people that promote this idea of sustainability are actually insane. And if we question that idea, then we better watch the insanity in ourselves as well. Because we don't understand what it truly means to be human. Whoops, there's another one. I must have been carried away with that one. <laughs> All right, what's happened in Australia in the last 20, 30, 40 years? We've destroyed under globalisation, privatisation and free trade. We've destroyed our country. We've destroyed farmers. We've destroyed the farming class. We've, we've lost, you know, from 300,000 farmers plus in the 1950s down to below 90,000 today. We've depopulated our internal areas. This is an insane policy. 22 million people today, right? The projected figures for our population by people like the great JJC Bradfield is we should be having closer to 60 to 70 million people by today. If you had a, a policy of real development, economic development for our country. But the fact is, you've had a lot of people race out of the internal part of Australia, literally. They've been kicked out. There's no jobs there. There's no infrastructure. You can't make a living farming anymore. I mean, you've got to compete with multinationals to market your produce in case of the wheat. You've got to compete with multinationals to buy the, the fertiliser from your for, for, for your growing your crops. And now even to buy the seed, you have to buy the seed, patented seed from large corporations like Monsanto, and you've got no other choice. So, as I was saying before, this is slavery. You don't have to change, but you've created the same circumstance by which people feel that. So they leave, they get out, they try and escape the bonds of slavery. And we've, we've been doing that for, to the point that people want to come into the cities and at least get away from the horrors of living in the bush. People want services in the bush. They want decent hospital care. They want decent access to education. We haven't done that. This is an insane society if we, we, when you look at what, we, what we're capable of doing. Let's talk about the idea of population density itself, mm -hmm. right? I live in Wills, Kelvin Thompson lives in Wells, and some of the areas of Wills have a population density of 9,000 people per square kilometre. Now, if people didn't want to live in those areas, they could always move. <laughs> no one's chaining them to live in those areas, right? But actually, people like to live in cities. They like to live in high-dense areas. Yes, they need access to decent infrastructure and, uh, and so forth. That's right. Like, you know, good pu public transport, great. That's, that's a given. That's why people live in these sorts of cities. But when you start to look at Australia as a whole, we have 2.8 people per square kilometre across our entire land mass. The average for Wills is 2.8. 2,440 persons per square kilometre. The irony here <coughs> is for the great vast wilderness areas of Tasmania with its great heritage listed areas and so on and so forth, they have a population density nearly three times that of Australia, 7.4 persons per square kilometre. And that's got massive areas of wilderness. So if you look at it, do the maths. With Will's density, you've got 18.5 billion people could live in here. Right? It would require real development, real economic development, and you could have a Tasmanian density, you could have 56 or 57 nearly million people in Australia. That's the reality, but we haven't developed our country. We haven't recognised what makes us human, in, in fact, as from an institution of government. We're a British-controlled part of the empire. So, there's some of the issues, but what are, what, what's even behind those issues that we actually have to be concerned about? What are the real issues that confront Australians and the countries of the world today that aren't even talked about in this election? Well, the fact is, we are in an ongoing financial disintegration of an already collapsed financial and monetary system. As Mr LaRouche has made it very clear in the last couple of, last 24 hours or so, we're looking at days and weeks before you can see a basic disintegration, vaporisation of the entire system. I don't know whether they're holding off the federal election here or what, but 
you know, maybe after Julia Gillard or Tony Abbott gets elected, we'll see a crash. I don't know. Mate, could they do that? I mean, mm. who knows? I mean, Australia's a pretty important part of the empire. But essentially what's happened is we have seen a deregulation of the entire financial system starting from effectively the time that Roosevelt died in 45, but the first large chink to fall off was when Nixon took the US dollar off gold and we had a floating exchange rate system. From then on, we've just simply printed money like you wouldn't believe. And specif specifically, we've created instruments that have no real value. These things called derivatives, which are equivalent to gambling debts. And our Australian banks are absolutely chockers of the things. 14 trillion at one point, 13.6 trillion right now on the off-balance sheet liabilities. Oh, they won't make any difference to, the to say, the banks. The Commonwealth Bank just announced a $6 billion profit. And people are saying, well, good, our banks are really, really uh, solvent. Mm -hmm. Crap. Look at the assets. Their assets are principally, 50%, as an inflated housing bubble assets, where they're counting housing, of all things, as an asset. Come back to that one. Australia has a housing bubble. Now, the measurement for affordability in housing is that houses should be about three and a half thousand times the sorry, three and a half times the median wage. Right? Australia's median wage right now is about forty seven and a half thousand dollars. So your average family home, do the maths, should be what, $170,000, $180,000? That's the price of what housing should be. But any place like I live in, close to half a million dollars. So Australia actually has the worst housing affordability in the world with an average of 6.5 times higher than the standard non-bubble rate. But the trap is, the values are the assets of the banks. So the banks have a housing bubble as their assets, yet they're claiming $6 billion profit, and they also have a massive amount of debt to cover. $886 billion of the uh, $1 trillion plus public and private debt is in the banks. $446 billion of that has to be turned over every 90 days refinance from foreign overseas lending. Now, their banks would have collapsed had not Kevin Rudd slapped on the bank guarantee back in 2008. Like other banks that collapsed around the world, but he saved them because he allowed the, the credit of the Australian government to prop up the banks. And Macquarie Bank made a hell of a lot of money out of that. Right, by trading and using cheap government credit to buy up you know, distressed companies and so forth. So what you have is you have a bank, banking system that is actually bankrupt. Not just here in Australia, but globally. So what do you have? Drugs. You've seen a monumental increase to cover, to try and plug the collapsing system with drug money. And the Afghanistan war is classic where you've seen a massive increase in the opium poppies uh, cultivated the hands-off approach by the Obama government towards eradicating the poppies and supporting the farmers, which the Russians have indicated they'd like to do. Where are those areas most protected? In the areas that are covered by the Commonwealth countries, Australia, Britain, and so forth. The old empire. Remember when I went back to the, right at the beginning? People are treated like beasts, drugs destroy people's minds. We see it every day in the breakdown of hospital infrastructure. You know, in the early 1990s, Jeff Kennett slashed 10% from the health budget here, immediately threw, threw the health system into crisis. You've got various methods of dealing with health care that don't work and haven't worked. They ended up shutting down many, many hundreds or you know, many tens of regional hospitals. So the waiting lists are just as long, the figures are just manipulated. 
you see stories on the media, the current affair and so forth, of nurses like the lady, uh, a registered nurse in a Dandenong hospital area that was sent home after having arm surgery or hand surgery. She was thrown out without any underclothes on into a cab in order to get her out of the hospital. That's not an unusual story. That is a common story. So this is the what, what's happening. What's happening in terms of the global financial system, if you go back to the triple curve function, that curve there is the yellow line at the top um, is the monetary aggregates, the amount of money that's being pumped into the system to prop the system out. That's your bank, that's your bailouts. Then you have the blue line down the bottom. That's the collapse of the physical economy. That's your shutting down of farms and productive industries, like I mentioned before. That's the, um, the shutdown of hospitals. And this is happening simultaneously and it's got to the point now where the entire system is in free fall. It's a matter of, only a matter of time between, before we actually have, have nothing, nothing left at all. As I said, the physical economy, the blue line, we don't even make, as Bill Ingrey said very eloquently in the local paper up there, we don't even make jocks anymore. And it must have got the attention of the journalists because they published that comment. <laughs> it's true, we don't. We hardly make anything here in this country anymore. So where's the real wealth? Well, it ain't here because we don't produce anything. So there's a solution to this, and the solution's been put on the table internationally by our friend, United States uh, physical economist, statesman, United States statesman and physical economist, Lyndon LaRouche. And that is, there's three steps, very clear. First of all, for a US and then global recovery, we have to remove Obama from office. Now, get him out. At all costs, the guy has had it. He's finished, he's, he's a lunatic, and I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. We have to then look at the re-implementation of the Glass-Steagall regulatory principles. And then thirdly, the construction of the greatest development project in history, the, the North American Water and Power Alliance, NAWAPA. And I'll go through these individually. And let's look at the first one, remove Obama Get him out now. Obama, as LaRouche pointed out in April of 2009, is a failed personality. He's a Nero complex. And now, as LaRouche said in the last two months or so, he's like a Hitler in the bunker. Everything he touches turns to shit. And consequently, doesn't turn to wine, it turns to shit. Because he is an absolute disaster. He doesn't want to look at reality. He, he just cannot look at reality. And what this means is he is, for example, he's bailed out the banks in the US to the tune of some $21 trillion. But there's no money for local municipalities. Fire brigades, fire, fire, firefighting houses are being shut down. You know, Places where there used to be 90 firemen, or there's only 50 now, unable to manage entire sectors of you know, suburbs. Uh, hospitals, nursing staff being laid off because there's no medical funds being paid by the federal government. Because why? This guy prefers to bail out the banks. Because he's an asset of the British Empire. He's an asset of the, the, uh, the British Empire. And there's not much more proof than that. <laughs> that he goes and visits the little old queen in Buckingham Palace, because that's that was a highlight of his um, his trip. He is an agent of the British of the British monetary system. So LaRouche's initiative is a political initiative. It's to work with the four largest powers: the China, India, and Russia in order to, be create, to create a new financial system, a new financial architecture. But to do that, you have to have a functional US president, who, who we don't have right now, Obama. Because Obama is part of the British, he's part of the British Empire. This Four Powers Agreement will build a new economy. And it's centered around, first and foremost, the concept that Mr. LaRouche has called for which is the re-implementation of the Glass-Steagall 
regulatory principles, a bankruptcy reorganisation. This is the, and he's saying, do the same thing in the United States that was done by Franklin Roosevelt. You have to get rid of the enormous amount of speculative debt that's within the system. We have four, uh, $1.4 quadrillion of debt, like derivatives, like the $14 trillion we have in our banking system, sitting on top of the productive economies of the world. You've seen the circumstances within Europe, where whole countries are looking at sovereign defaults, Greece, Italy, Spain, you know, the so-called pigs countries, Portugal, right? Iceland, Ireland. All these countries are about to collapse because they can no longer pay the debt that has been you know, used in bailouts and to prop up this failing system. So Mr. LaRouche says, implement Glass-Steagall straight away. And that means you quarantine the commercial banks, which is the legitimate banks that you need for the running the economy, the real part of the economy, to pay wages, to you know, invest, to pay the manufacturers, loans, all that sort of stuff. Quarantine that and you say to Wall Street and these others, you are finished. Go away. Quarantine them. Park them off in the corner for 100 years. Don't talk to them. Get rid of the merchant banking, investment banking side. This part over here, the commercial banking side, is necessary. Now here in Australia, we have to look at the same ideas. But we have to have new regulations that can quarantine the legitimate part of the economy and uh, protect it and get rid of the speculative debt. And we did that with the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill, which is another one of Mr. LaRouche's proposals here in Australia. But every country has to pass the same sort of legislation. So in effect, by having an international political agreement amongst the four powers, that political agreement is based upon, first and foremost, a global Glass-Steagall, get rid of the debt, protect your local economy. That's what has to happen in this country. Go back to the idea of sovereignty. As I said, the sovereign nation state protects the idea of citizens, your, your people, the general welfare. It protects the development of your people for generations, for, for their future posterity. That's what, a national, that's what national sovereignty means. We actually have to have that idea come back into government. Of course, you know, Roosevelt's proposals saved the American system. And this, that gave us the ability then to move on to the next phase of global reconstruction through initially, uh, initially through the United States. Because by getting rid of the bad banks, getting rid of the speculative parasites, like he did with the Glass-Steagall legislation in 1933, he was then able to start to fund large-scale infrastructure development projects. So, you know, the, the alliance of the four powers uh, is, <coughs> is essentially a declaration, a political declaration. And it's simply that the world's current financial and monetary system is totally bankrupt, and we've got to initiate a global bankruptcy reorganisation process through implementing a global Glass-Steagall reform. We have to put a new financial system in place based upon fixed exchange rates, tariff protection, and national, not central banking and therefore allow countries to have their sovereignty back. That's a political agreement. And as soon as the United States kicks Barack Obama out, gets rid of this creep, this failed personality, this Nero and Hitler in the bunker, then the quicker we can move globally to this sort of system, because these other countries will move. And finally, the third point of Mr. LaRouche's uh, three steps to US and global recovery is the, the construction of the greatest development project in history, the North American Water and Power Alliance. Now this is a recent initiative that's come from the basement crew because what this is, is this is the ability to turn a dark age around that we're in, we're on the precipice of being fully in, and begin to re-energise and remoralize the people of the United States first and then by example, the rest of the world. This is just not some grand project for rivers and uh, so forth and water. This is a project to, in a sense, spiritually we'll reawaken what it means to be a human being. And Mr. LaRouche has some very important things to say about this question of infrastructure, because infrastructure is just not building bridges. It's just not 
you know, having good roads. There's much more to infrastructure than that. And he says... And the solution is typified by the concept we're applying for the WAPA. Now, what's the driving force? The driving force depends upon your understanding something. Don't talk about infrastructure, because most people don't know what the word infrastructure is supposed to mean. Or what it means to them is bullshit. The, actually, the driver of productivity is properly defined infrastructure. Now, what is that? It's an increase in the energy flux density supplied for production. It's an increase in the amount of life on the planet, the rate of production. It's an increase in the quality of life produced. It's an increase in the efficiency of getting from one place to the other that's functional. It's an increase in the access to resources. It's an increase in the energy flux density of power. These things are the real infrastructure. It's an increase in education by destroying what's caught as education today. It's the education for the creative powers, development of the creative powers of the children and their adolescents. That's, that's infrastructure. And from that, you harvest agriculture and production. And the process of infrastructure is the process of education by understanding the history of man's knowledge of how this is done and advancing that history to new heights. Doing the impossible and discovering how it becomes possible. So that's what what's Lynn has defined the last couple of days about the power of what we're talking about when we talk about infrastructure. It's a new dimensionality because and when you start to look at what he is proposing, or what, the, what he is proposing for the United States, it has global implications, like I said before, particularly here for Australia. And there's always a mistake from a lot of chauvinists in our country to think that, oh, right, we should start from Australia and build outwards. But we have to be part of the global solution, part of the global Nawapa, to really understand what it is that Mr. LaRouche is talking about. Now, what you have in the United States right now is... I'll go back to the other one, it looks better. Mm -hmm. yeah, is you have masses of skilled unemployment, unemployed people, engineers in particular, particularly on the West Coast. You might remember that California was, you know, the, the uh, Silicon Valley and, you know, it was a high-tech state. So you have a lot of people in the vicinity of the West Coast. You have a lot of de deserts in that part of the country on that, but you also have a massive shortage of water. So by using water, bringing water down from Alaska, physically building the infrastructure, you begin to change the biosphere. Now Vernatsky talks about this concept of the bio, biogenic migration of atoms. And this actually is a function of life. Uniquely life, life processes take inert matter and they reorganize it and they concentrate it more and more and more into higher orders of existence, right? So by providing water, by man intervening through his cognitive powers, through his creative powers to solve the problems and bringing water into this area, right, you increase the potential for the, what's called the water cycle. Because water has a cycle. It, is it, it comes out of the oceans in the, in the sense of uh, condensation or off green plants and then it precipitates onto the ground. Right? Also from green plants. The more green plants you have, the more possibility you have for precipitation. Because you're feeding this cycle, this carbon cycle. So green plants are one of the most powerful forces of life on the planet today. They tie together a series of cycles, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, fixing carbon dioxide from the air and creating 
higher levels of energy in the form of carbohydrates and organic molecules inside the plant. They're the most efficient solar collectors on the face of the planet and you know, that's why we've got to get rid of solar panels because solar panels actually do the opposite. You also have the nitrogen cycle which is the process of fixing nitrogen from the air as well. So you have you know, 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So by providing water, go back to the process of physically man intervening in the biosphere to build water projects and take water where it's never been before naturally, we are providing for the power of life in the sense of green plants to do their thing. We are increasing our power in the biosphere by providing the power by, by allowing the biosphere to do itself its, its natural thing. And you, go, you come right down to the molecular level, this means effectively greening the deserts. There's 86,000 kilometres, square kilometres, of landmass that the Nawapa project would green and provide for agriculture. That means provide for water for trees and for high value crops in order to change the environment, green the desert. And it all comes down to that little molecule, actually. That thing called a chlorophyll. As Lynn refers to it as a gollywog-like molecule that is the essence of green plant life. It's, set, it's got a magnesium molecule in the middle with a few bit of nitrogen around it. And the rest of it is pure hydrocarbons, or you know, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. But greening the deserts. Now by greening the deserts, by providing the water, you increase the, the, the transpiration rate of the landmass, which means you change the climate. So the proposal for the WAPA is to take 15% of the water, only 15% of the water from the Alaskan region, where it just runs out to the sea and does nothing, channel that down through the Rocky Mountain Gorge, Rocky Mountain Trench, Right, <coughs> using uh, potential hydroelectric stations and dams along the way and then lift it up uh, over a mountain range and let it run down on the inside of the United States to refill the Aguila, um, Aguila Lala, uh, aquifer and also to supplement and increase the water supply to the entire west coast of the United States and to, to Mexico. But it doesn't finish there. That's just the beginning because you have to combine that. You would combine that with the state-of-the-art magnetic levitation train systems and you would then build, as an extension of Nawapa, the Bering Strait Tunnel. And that will then create, in effect, a transcontinental railroad system in which every continent except Australia from rail at this point would be hooked up with high-speed state-of-the-art uh, rail systems but also you would have the significant development of the latest or the, la the, the, the latest form of um, development which is called the development corridor. <coughs> Throughout history mankind's always uh, established itself near close watercourses you know, or in the, around the outside of a country like us or along river systems in order to have cheap water and the various um, access to the resources necessary. This is a development corridor. This is a man-made phenomenon where you, you provide the high-speed rail systems and the, the, the water through water projects, the nuclear power through nuclear nuplexes and you literally go in to regions which were previously uninhabitable create cities and create new industries. This is what mankind can do. So, what would Australia's participation be in a global Nawapa program? Well, first of all, we're going to build rail, rail systems as well. We're going to have high speed shipping until we overcome the problem of trying to tunnel between Darwin and, the, um, and Timor and uh, other Indonesian islands. 
We need water systems and we need nuclear power. All of this, because people say, well, how are you going to do this? How are you going to fund it? It comes back to the concept of what I was talking about with the Glass-Steagall reform and the Four Powers Agreement. The new Four Powers Agreement with the Glass-Steagall reform, we no longer have monetary systems. Monetary systems are part of the idea of empire. They're used to control people. Now, in 1945, under the death of Roosevelt, that was a great tra turning point, a great tragedy in the history of, our of the world because Roosevelt was pro going to provide for a system of national banks to create national credit amongst sovereign nation states to do exactly what we're proposing to do today, to create large infrastructure development projects within each sovereign country. He died. And instead, we got the IMF World Bank system, the Keynesian monetarist system, which in fact is the same sort of monetarist system that all empires operate on. In a sense, he who controls the money controls the country. So we've got to go back to national banking and credit systems to fund this. Because once we've put this, the, our country through Glass-Steagall reform, we have to find billions of dollars. And I was saying about $200 billion per year to completely transform the backbone, the physical economic backbone of our country. Lance Endersby, our dear friend who passed away last year, proposed back in 1997 that we could open up our country by having an Australian ring road high-speed rail system, open up new ag areas of agriculture, new mining areas, but more importantly, bring us into close proximity to Asia so that we can export high-value, high-perishable goods out through Darwin and into the most populous part of our neck of the woods, Asia. This is completely feasible. We could have built it by now, but we haven't because we're part of the empire, we're part of this stinking empire that wants to keep us enslaved and have lackeys like Thompson and Dick Smith keep us as animals, as pets of the empire. We could have had these high-speed trains. Yeah, we could have had those. You know, running on average at 350 kilometres per hour, running right up through Darwin. We would prefer, of course, to have maglev trains. That is the state of the art. You know, wheelless trains that run on magnetically levitation uh, tr uh, tracks. These trains are capable of speeds of 500 plus just in the first generation. You could see after further, you know, further development, a few years down the track, these trains reaching six, seven, eight hundred kilometres an hour on the ground. So I mean, this is the sort of ideas, the vision that we haven't heard in this election campaign at all. The fast train, we, 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 the closest we've come is a feasibility study for a fast train between what, Newcastle and Sydney? And possibly Epping to Parramatta or somewhere like that? I yeah. can't remember. But, but guess what? Every single promise you're going to hear in this election is going to be forgotten about. Because the global financial system is in a process of disintegration. That's the reality. So everything, when you see their lips move, you know they're lying. <laughs> All right? Because of that reason. I think I've got a video clip here of the Trans Rapid. Do you want to watch it again? It's fantastic. Yeah. You want to watch it again? Good. Because I want to watch it. And hopefully it'll play. Ah! The Trans Rapid Maglev system, an entirely new train system, the first to overcome the limitations of wheel and rail. Because the vehicle moves entirely without contact, it makes train travel faster, easier on the environment, and more economical. The functions of the wheel and rail on a normal railroad, including support, guidance, propulsion, and braking, are accomplished in the Trans Rapid through an electromagnetic levitation and propulsion system. Mechanics have been replaced by electronics. 
Support magnets draw the vehicle towards the guideway from below, while guidance magnets hold it laterally on track. These support and guidance magnets are mounted on both sides of the vehicle along its entire length. An electronic control system ensures that it levitates at a constant height of 10 millimeters above the guideway. While levitating, the vehicle has 15 centimeters of clearance. The maglev train is propelled and braked by a synchronous, long stator linear motor. This motor is not located in the vehicle itself, but rather in the guideway. It functions on the same principle as a traditional rotating electrical motor whose stator has been cut open, unrolled, and stretched lengthwise along both sides of the guideway. But instead of a rotating magnetic field, a traveling magnetic field is generated in the windings, one that pulls the vehicle along the guideway without contact. The Transrapid Guideway can run at ground level or be elevated which allows it to be flexibly adapted to individual operating circumstances. The guideway can be elevated where it makes ecological sense. In this case, it won't divide the landscape or developed areas. And the area beneath the guideway can continue to be used as before. The guideway can be built at ground level, for example, to minimize visual impacts or allow easier collocation with existing transportation systems. In any case, the Maglev Systems Guideway requires less land and space than other transportation systems. The Transrapid vehicle changes tracks by using bendable steel switches. These switches consist of a continuous steel beam elastically bent by an electromechanical setting drive to achieve a smooth turnout. In the bent position, the vehicle can pass over the switch at speeds up to 200 kilometers per hour. In the straight position, the vehicle can run at full operating speed. Transrapid has very favorable alignment parameters with small curve radii and a grade climbing ability of 10%. The Transrapid guideway can therefore be adapted to the landscape instead of the other way around. The operation control system controls and safeguards the vehicles, switches, guideway and stations along the maglev route. The vehicle communicates with the control system by means of directional radio data transmission. The vehicle's location is monitored by means of a location reference system integrated into the guideway. The only motor section in operation along the guideway is the one in which the vehicle is currently traveling. When the vehicle passes from one section to the next, the new motor section is automatically switched on. More power is supplied on gradients and acceleration segments along the route than on flat segments. This way the propulsion power is distributed very economically. It's always available exactly where it's needed. Non-contact technology makes the Transrapid very fast. It is designed for operating speeds of between 300 and 500 kilometers per hour. This enables trip times over medium and long distances, which have until now only been achieved by aircraft. The Transrapid requires less than two minutes and a stretch of only five kilometers to accelerate from zero to 300 kilometers per hour. The maglev system requires significantly less energy than other transportation systems. 
Used under similar conditions, the specific primary energy requirement of a car is three times higher and that of an airplane five times higher than the Transrapid. Beyond that, the Transrapid generates no rolling or motor noise. Even at 200 kilometers per hour, it's hardly audible. At this speed, the vehicle glides quietly through cities and population centers. The non-contact technology is also an important economic factor. Due to the low maintenance requirements and energy consumption, the operating costs of the maglev system are lower than those of high-speed trains. Infrastructure costs are approximately the same. The smallest Transrapid train set consists of two sections. Depending on passenger numbers, vehicles with up to 10 sections can be operated. For high-value cargo transport, container sections with a capacity of 15 tons each can also be used. The Transrapid maglev system offers a high level of comfort and safety. The non-contact levitation and propulsion technology guarantees absolutely smooth running. No jolting can be felt. Passengers don't have to wear safety belts and are free to move about the cars. The innovative technology provided by the Transrapid Maglev system opens up new dimensions in rail travel. Flying on the ground with the Transrapid is easy on the environment, safe, comfortable, and brings passengers directly to the city centers. Whether short or long haul, non-contact technology makes the Transrapid Maglev system the best connection. All right. <clears throat> so, here we have, I've showed you this before, or some of you might not have seen that, but that system, what's uh, exciting about that system is the fact that you can have 15 tons uh, in a 10 carriage train. That's 150 tonnes of high-value cargo. You know, if you have freight maglevs running from Melbourne to Darwin, it's about 4,000 kilometres. It's an eight-hour trip. Right? If you're anywhere along that line, you can have you know, people pick up a train, put stuff on a train, and you've got that access out through Darwin. But there is a problem. And that's why we have to develop our high-speed shipping which we uniquely have here in Australia. I mean, there's Darwin here, and we have access to all these different regions up there. At the present time, we haven't determined that there's any possible mode of tunnelling that can be done. There are things called floating tunnels that exist. Um, there's submerged tunnels like the Sydney Harbour one that were built in 100 metre long sections. The floating tunnel idea can be the, in the form of a tunnel that's anchored off, a, it's a big concrete tube that floats in, in water, but usually it's in still bodies of water. So there's no currents and so forth. But, and also to build a tunnel from Darwin to Timor is 715 kilometres, mm. or the same distance from Brisbane to, to Rockhampton. Mm. And that's a long way under the sea but to be able to build that. So there's certain technological difficulties that we have to solve if we're to build a maglev system under the sea or in the floating tunnels. How far is but the Bering Strait? <coughs> the Bering Strait is nowhere near that distance. Uh, just, under under just under 100 k. Just under 100 k. And you've got the centre island. So, I mean, there's all sorts of different ideas you could come with that. And there is also an association for tunnelling, the Australian Tunnelling Association. They've got lots of references on building underground tunnels. But we already have, thank goodness, we already have two of the world's leading high-speed catamaran manufacturers here in Australia. One is INCAT in Tasmania, the other is Austral Shipping in West Australia. And the point is that if you are looking at solving this problem from use of roll-on, roll-off containerising, for example, if you had two maglev trains with 15 tonnes of cargo on it, you could roll them and roll them off somehow onto a, a high-speed catamaran and be off across 
the team will see in no time. Now they, these travel at about 40 to 50 knots in good weather. But again you've got weather considerations. But this is the sort of directionality that we need to head with in order to open up. And this is something that Lance Endersby said was quite possible and feasible even now with B-double trucks travelling up into Darwin. <coughs> so combine that with the potential of magneto-hydrodynamic drives, nuclear powered, meaning nuclear powered ships, a fleet, a hundred of these ships going out of Darwin all the time, connected to a high speed magnetic levitation train system carrying high value freight. Look where Australia could be. But let us not dream too much at the moment under a monetary system. Mm -hmm. The other thing we have to build is water projects. Just think about Nawapa. Man is taking water to the land to transform the entire face of the planet in, in North America. Look at our country. Look how empty it is. Look how desolate it is. What happens if we start to look at this entire area? Now, yes, there's a lot of salt in Western Australia. We know that. But Lance Endersby has already said that if we were to dam the Fitzroy River, we could irrigate half a million acres of land in the Great Sandy Desert. How much more could we reclaim with water? If we were to be intensively greening this part of the Australia, which is usually hot and dry, what will that do to the climate? Will that create extra transpiration to change the weather patterns within Australia, as they're proposing? in the United States. And remember, this is about the same size as the United States. What's possible? If you look at the Fitzroy River, it's a huge river. This is a great sandy desert. Now, not all the sandy desert, of course, is going to be usable, but you're going to find pockets of the desert that is usable. It's one of the, you know, one of the guys, the, one of the local people here that I took the, um, that took something to get sharpened with, freaked out when, I put, when we put that rail system across from, you know, Broome across into Alice Springs, almost, right? He said, that's a desert, what's out there? You can't put a railway there, there's nothing there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why we're putting it there. It's because when you develop that area, or have the potential for development through providing infrastructure, increasing the energy, increasing the ability to move goods. Go back to what Lynn was saying about what infrastructure actually does. That, when we, you know, that bit that, we, uh, that he read, that, that he spoke before on. That's the role of infrastructure. Infrastructure is not to get you it plays a role not to you get you from your nighttime job to home and to work and to home to work. Infrastructure plays a much more profound role than just that. But look at the Bradfield scheme. This is what Dr. JJC Bradfield was envisaging for Queensland. He was hoping that by building the Bradfield scheme he would change the climate in Queensland. And it wasn't just because he was wanting to fill up Lake Eyre through feeding all these, this water into Lake Eyre. It wasn't that. It was actually from greening Queensland. Because this particular area of central Queensland, he was hoping to open up for massive amounts of irrigation from permanent water supplies, fed from the Burdekin and Tully rivers to the north. But all this, 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 this stripy stuff through here is all new irrigation areas. He was going to build two abattoirs, two more power stations, right? and then green the inside of Queensland. What would that do to the weather, weather patterns? He was wondering about that. That's what one of his, one of his goals was back in. So look at, think about that in terms of the proposals for Nawapa, what we've already been thinking about here in Australia. But the final, well, there's two other aspects of what we have to do, and that's to develop our nuclear power potential, which is a crime that we don't do it, and why? is because in order to build infrastructure that's effective, you have to use increasing levels of energy flux density. You can't power a magnetic levitation ring road through either windmills, which run flat, because the sun hasn't shone for three days. Well, there's no wind. The energy flux density from things like solar and wind is so low that the cost of putting windmills up and solar panels is greater than the total amount of energy you'll get out of those things for their entire lifetime. It's complete fraud. But why are we getting this renewable energy thrust? Well, we're part of the empire. 
We're part of this system that wants to reduce the world's population because we're animals from 6.8 billion down to less than 2 billion people. That's what this is about. Just the same way that nothing else of any real relevance and importance has been discussed in this campaign about real economic development and it's all crap, that's the same reason you're not hearing about the necessity to do away with these things like solar and, uh, and wind power and we're actually getting you know, more and more promotion of it. In fact, there was a, today on the news there was an announcement of the biggest wind farm in the southern hemisphere being started in southwest Victoria today. Insanity. And a population that believes this stuff and supports this stuff does not have the moral fitness to survive. Why? It's because you're believing that human beings are nothing more than animals. Coming back to that premise. So what we have to do is we have to increase the energy flux density available for infrastructure. We have to move out of fossil fuels. Oil is very useful for other petrochemicals, for various compounds you don't have to manufacture, but not for burning in cars. We need to move to, you know, to move quickly into fission power. We've got the raw materials for that, as we know. Um, you know, we, we can build these modular high temperature gas cooled reactors using ceramic encased uh, uh, fuel uh, beads. Australia has the highest reserves in the world of thorium, a non peripherable material that actually takes plutonium and burns it up and has to use plutonium to get kick-started. We could build with our reserves of thorium a nuclear industry par none and begin to build modular high temperature gas cooled reactors. We've got the world's uh, largest reserves of uranium <coughs> in a form that's rel relatively usable. As soon as you start talking about this, oh but mining uranium it really does mess up the environment. You know, they use so much water and the water can't be harnessed and blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, in Queensland, you've got craters of coal extraction, permanent craters being dug off the earth's crust for coal mining. But that, that's not mentioned, right? That's not, that's not mentioned. We've got to go back to solar anyway, according to all these people. <laughs> right? So we have to develop our nuclear power capabilities because to do so we can then increase the capacity for infrastructure as I was saying build and fleet of ships with small nuclear powered reactors we can then move forward from there into developing the next level of um, energy which is thermonuclear fusion which is millions of times more powerful than thermonuclear fission and then we have new energy processes associated with that to be able to transform uh, our infrastructure and environment, run our cars on water, potentially. Our ring road proposal, a ring rail proposal would be powered by modular high temperature gas cooled reactors using thorium and desalinate seawater where there wasn't enough water because it, was, it hasn't been brought there yet or simply because it uh, doesn't exist there. It might be in the form of salt water or under, under water, salt water under, under, underground. The solution for the global financial crisis is not that difficult. Politically, it might be more difficult. But it's to commit the future of mankind by developing our unique human creative qualities of being able to make discoveries of the principles by which the universe works. That's what makes us human and commit to going back to space is another aspect of this to discover those new principles to use on earth to solve the problems that we have back here. Which is the last part of what I want to mention today. We need to participate in redeveloping our Australian space industry. With the ring road, with the potential for Cape York, for the potential for nuclear power, we can move quickly to re-establishing the frontier of real scientific endeavour and that's to go back into space. Mankind is not trapped by the surface of the earth. We could quickly move to establishing automatic, factory, automatic factories on the surface of the moon to mine the helium-3 up there and to develop you know, in the industrialisation of the moon. Ten other countries are already committed right now to do that. 
but Australia has it. To do that, we're going to have to master the field of cosmic radiation that LaRouche has been talking about and the basement has been talking about. The fact that space is not empty. There is no such thing as empty space. That we are bombarded by all forms of cosmic radiation, whether that be you know, gravitational fields, electrical fields, magnetic fields, uh, electromagnetic, ra electromagnetic radiation, that's in the form of you know, gamma rays or UV light or infrared rays or you know, normal visible rays or cosmic rays themselves, which are high speed you know, particles. We don't know how much, of this, how much of this stuff actually affects the processes of life on the face of the planet. Therefore, we have an enormous amount of endeavour, enormous amount of scientific investigation, which we humans are used to, or should be used to be doing, to look into. We have a tremendous mission. So that's what my campaign represents, that's what the CEC represents, a vision for the future. And like I said, we haven't talked about personality politics all night. We talked about real ideas. Thank you very much. I think the next slide says questions. <laughs>